This is Hannah Mail, and the videos that you are about to watch go over the PowerPoints for my class on the 1999 film, The Mum Me. Uh, the PowerPoint that I will be going over in this video uh, is chapter one on the Think If It course. Um, so with that said, I'm just going to share my screen here and then we will dive into it. Um, so as I said, we're going to go to um, slideshow view. So as I said, these, these videos will go over the PowerPoints for the Mummy uh, Thinkific course. This video, this video, which covers the uh, chapter one PowerPoint on the course website, and then the next video will go over some of the background. Um, so the background of the field of Egyptology, overall cr chronology of Egypt, and that is important because for the historicity of some of the film's characters that we're going to talk about a little bit later, the film presents them as all living in, in the same time, which they did not. But if you don't have at least a sort of summary of Egyptian chronology in your head, the terms that I'm going to use to, to, to explain when the different characters most likely lived aren't going to make a lot of sense. Um, so this is a timeline of ancient Egypt, and this is a graphic from a site that I use a fair amount that is wonderful educational resources called the World History Encyclopedia, even though it says the Ancient History um, Encyclopedia here. Um, and this is their URL for their website here. Um, so this map or, or this timeline for ancient Egypt only goes to the third um, intermediate. So we're going to go into the, all these different periods a little bit more, but the main thing to get from this timeline is that ancient e e Egypt lasted a heck of a long time, um, over 3,000 years. Um, and the periods when it was a centralized state, there was one governing family in charge um, or one dynasty have been called kingdoms by Egyptologists, and then the periods when the state broke up, broke apart and there were competing dynasties and families have been labeled intermediate periods. Um, in terms of the kingdoms that are most well known to the general public, that's the old kingdom, also called the Pyramid Age, because that's when most of the pyramids at least, again, are known to the general public, unlike the Giza Plateau were built. Uh, you do have pharaohs build pyramids in the Middle Kingdom as well um, here, so a little bit later on, but those aren't quite as well made as the Old Kingdom pyramids, or at least the materials that they use for the Middle Kingdom ones have not survived time quite as well as the pyramids on the Giza Plateau from the Old Kingdom. Um, so then we also have the New kingdom and when most people think of ancient Egypt that's the period that they're thinking about because that's um, the period that most of the sort of pharaohs and rulers both male and female th that are known to the general public most of them come from the new kingdom um, and that is somewhat true for the characters that we're going to talk about a little bit later uh, from the film as well. Um, so this is just a poster um, that references a, another uh, mummy type film. And in this case, it's sheet music. And so I put this slide here mainly to give you a sense of kind of Egyptomania um, in um, America and sort of that spread with Egyptian culture that's that's been a large part of the 19th through 21st century. <laughs> So the first background large 
topic that we're going to talk about is sort of how the field of Egyptology begins um, and its entanglement with what I call the isms. Uh, so racism, Eurocentricism, uh, and imperialism are kind of the big three. Um, and I want to talk about this in a little bit of depth because it's something that if you watch the film closely, it kind of refers to. Uh, so first we're going to talk about the beginnings of Egyptology as a discipline. So the beginnings of the Egyptology as a discipline um, in terms of, you know, it's kind of a scientific field of study is usually dated to 1798 through 1801. This is when Na Napoleon, um, in an effort to upset British dominance of kind of the Western world um, led his troops into the military expedition into Egypt. Um, and so they didn't uh, win that military fight, but they were in Egypt, Napoleon and his troops from 1798 to 1801. Um, and they produced or out of this expedition because Napoleon, in addition to the soldiers that he brought along with him, he also brought along what uh, what he called savions, which were basically early antiquarians and people, scholars that were interested in Egypt, because the idea was that he wanted a military and cultural recording of all the ancient sites and of sort of all the land features that uh, they came upon during their campaigns into different parts of Egypt. And so this is where we get this multi-volume work that is still consulted by Egyptology scholars called the dis called the dis called the description de Egypt. So this is a work that came out in multiple volumes um, after Napoleon's military campaign um, had ended in its fiasco. Um, and so this was probably the the most lasting and enduring impact of his um, expedition. And when the when the description day Egypt was released, it really spread um, knowledge of and fascination with the remains of ancient Egypt to the general public as well, because these volumes contained drawings um, in detail of these different sites. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, one of the other things that comes out of Napoleon's expedition is it sort of starts the mark of the formal Western penetration and control of the Egyptian state. Um, so for a lot of kind of the roughly the first half of the 19th century, so the 1800s, the imperialist competition that played out in Egypt was between Britain and France. Um, and Britain eventually won the kind of military side of that, but France was left in control of a lot of cultural aspects. So like for a long time, the head of the antiquities service was a French man. Um, then, as I said, the dis the dis the description de la Egypt, which is the description of Egypt, is probably the most enduring Egyptology work to come out of this. Um, and then connected with the expedition as well um, is a particular object that was found um, at the site of the Mesha in the course of the French soldiers. Um, fortifying a particular fort there for a military campaign. Um, and this object was given the was given the name the Rosetta Stone. Um, and this proved crucial um, in letting uh, the the Western world and Western scholars figure out how to read hieroglyphics. Um, and again, if you dive deeper into that story, um, traditionally, Champollion has been, who's um, on the French side, has been given the, the major credit. Um, but then if you dig a little bit deeper, you'll find that the British through, I think, Arthur Young have also made claims that his work was just as 
important. And so again, you peel back the curtain even a little bit and you see hints of that imperialistic rivalry between the two nations that sort of gets enfolded into the scholarship. Um, recent decades have also seen increasing awareness that medieval Arabic scholars had actually looked at hieroglyphics as well and had made some pretty good strides in starting to uh, untangle and, and figure out how to read it as well, which is why I said that the Rosetta Stone is what allowed Western scholars to really start to understand hieroglyphics. And the way that it did that was that it had um, the same inscription um, in three different scripts. So in hieroglyphics, in demonic, and Greek. And so because scholars already, already knew the demonic and the Greek, they were able to use that to sort of start to figure out what the hieroglyphics said. Um, and the original um, artifact was actually a record of donation to, or land donations to a temple or temples during the Ptolemaic period. Um, and of course, where the, Rosa, where the Rosetta Stone eventually ended up ties into the, the politics of imperialism as well. Um, because as I said, um, in terms of the military conflict and the military campaign, uh, the British ended up winning that and Napoleon actually ended up fleeing Egypt and leaving his troops um, behind. Um, and so as part of the treaty arrangements that marked Britain's victory, um, they got most of the objects that the French scholars had collected along their travels as basically loot. Um, and the Rosetta Stone was one of these objects. And so that's kind of the larger story of why it's in the British Museum, which um, you don't have to do a lot of digging to find out that the British Museum is basically where a lot of Brit Britain's empire gains um, have ended up rather in the Louvre, uh, which is the um, sort of French national museum where a lot of their imperialistic type gains um, have ended up. Um, and so the spread of knowledge of hieroglyphs Glyphics to the sort of general public is roughly from about 1822 to the 1830s. So by roughly the 1850s, the basics of the hieroglyphic script are pretty understood by scholars. And you start to get dictionaries and grammar things like that, that, you know, disseminate what they've found out. Uh, so this is a text um, at, at the temple wall of, of Phile, um, and it's from members of Napoleon's expedition. Uh, so it's from 3rd March 1799, which again just brings home that while the description that Egypt is the main cultural thing that came out of this, it was in fact an active military campaign that um, can be placed in, in the wider context of the um, imperialism and sort of geopolitics um, of the time. So this is just a tangible, you know, left behind um, kind of of that. This is um, Battle of the, this is a depiction of the Battle of the Nile, which was the one of the main battles where the French forces lost to the British during the French campaign and this um the British side had of course Lord Nelson so it's 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 after this battle that he kind of achieves uh his fame um this is a political cartoon from the British side that sort of makes fun of Na Napoleon fleeing Egypt um, and kind of losing to the British for says. This is 
one of the front piece, uh, or this is the front piece of the description de la Egypt. So as I said, uh, um, the main cultural impact that came out of the campaign came out on um, and still consulted by Egyptologists to today because for some of the sites, literally the only record that we have of what was once there. And then this is a image of the rose at a stone that's now in the British Museum. Um, so this, these are the hieroglyphics here on top. This is the demonic and th this is the Greek. Um, so again, these two languages were known and since all these inscriptions each said the same thing, they are able to sort of um, use educated guessing to kind of start to figure hieroglyphs um, out. So this is uh, from uh, after, or uh, it's from 1880, and this is uh, a textbook. So by then, as I've said, sc scholars have sort of figured out the basics, and now they're just now they're disseminating that knowledge to their st students and to sort of the um, next generation as well. This is a plate from the dis from the de description de la Egypt. So this is looking at Memphis. Um, so the Sphinx on the Giza plateau, and then one of the pyramids um, as well, and some of the French savants and maybe soldiers that were in the area um, at that point. Um, these are also from the dis from the de description de la Egypt. Um, a Again, more plates of the different sites that were um, on the military campaign and what they looked like. This is from the description day Egypt, and it's from the island of Elephantine and one of the temples that was there at that point. This is um, from the description de la Egypt as well, and this is a topographical map of the overall area of Thebes and sort of the, the different ruins and clusters um, of things that they found. And so this is one of the very um, most invaluable things about the description de la Egypt is it has these maps of these general areas. Um, and again, we no longer have some of these spots partly due to urbanization. So it really helps to give us, um, you know, a, piece of that site's history. This is from the description de la Egypt as well. This is um, in Thebes um, and it's in, uh, so it's in the general region of Thebes, but it's in the Med Medina Habu, which is the mortuary temple of Ramses III. Um, and if you read the description de la e Egypt for sites like Medina Habu and the temples of Karnak and Luxor, you'll see the French word for palace because at that point, um, a lot of the scholars still thought that these sites were big palaces. It wasn't yet clear that they were temples um, from, from different uh, eras. So uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about scientific archaeology. And I say that with the quotes because there was still a lot of um, imperialism and racism that was mixed in. Um, but generally speaking, or roughly speaking, post 1880s ish, you have the excavations in Egypt going um, about in more method, um, in, in, in more regimented ways. And their Egyptologists and archaeologists are basically no longer looking for just the shiny and pretty stuff that can go in, into their museums or private collections. Um, and in e Egyptology, the person that's usually given the, the most credit for sort of starting that approach um, is Sir William Petrie, whom you see here. Um, and he was known for uh, not just again, focusing on the shiny things, but focusing on the 
pottery and the, the things of everyday life and really recording um, his excavations in what we would call a kind of scientific and regimented manner. Uh, one of the things that that he's also quite well known for um, is his seriation technique, which is a way of relative dating. So radiocarbon dating, which is where we get the absolute calendar dates, only came about in the 1950s and after. So for the 19th and early 20th century, the kinds of dating sagetologists had to work with was systems of relative dating, which is basically you take a class of objects um, and you mark their changes over time and figure out, okay, which one comes later, which one comes early, which one comes early. So Petrie did this um, with this black-topped Egyptian pottery that comes from the pre-dynastic period. And, and this was basically the first systematic relative dating system um, that we had. And it's still used in some ways by Egyptologists as well, even though we now have radiocarbon and the um, ability to put real or calendar um, dates uh, in there as well. So this is uh, from a Petri publication. So this is the pottery that he used. And so these numbers represent relative dates in terms of this style is older or younger than some of the other styles that you see on the chart. Um, this is not to say that William Petrie was perfect. So he was born in 1853. He died in 1942. Um, and one of these things that you also saw with scientific archaeology um, in the second half of the 19 or the 1800s was the growth of scientific racism, which is basically um, using mistaken views of biology to uh, say that different nations or races are better than others. Um, and so Petrie very much was aware of this trend um, and, and he um, definitely uh, somewhat ascribed to it um, as well. So um, as I put it um, on this particular slide, he's firmly embedded in the racial climate um, of his day. And there's a recent book that's been published by University College of London, and the exact title is Escaping Me. Basically, it looks in detail at Petrie's relationship to um, and relationships with um, what we would call um, eugenics um, of that period. Um, and one of the ways that you can see this um, in Petrie's work um, is when he looked at what Egyptologists now call the pre-dynastic period, one of the things that he noticed is there was suddenly evidence of this whole new culture that came in. Um, and the way that Petrie first viewed this was this culture that was more advanced, more civilized um, was a white dynastic race, as he termed it, um, that invaded Egypt um, and basically took over. Um, and again, I'm, I'm doing this in quotes because this is literally some of the words that he used, uh, the inferior exhausted um, mulatto natives and slowly introduced the higher dynastic civilization as it interbred with them. So basically you do have these racist assumptions that are embedded in his thinking where uh, white equals, the, the skin color white equals a sort of higher realm of living and thinking um, and, and dark equals lower on the social scale. Um, 
And so because of these racist beliefs, while Petrie did eventually acknowledge that the amount of evidence he found pointed to an indigenous origin for the emergence of what what we would term Egyptian culture, which is what um, Egyptologists think today, it took him a long time to finally come to that conclusion. And a lot of that can probably be traced to the sort of racist assumptions that kind of put that mental block um, in his thinking. And then, as I said, he also had pretty clear links with the eugenics movement that was going on um, at roughly the same time as well. And some of the people that were prominent in that movement, um, like Francis Gall. Okay, so now that I've given a very brief background on how Egyptology as a kind of scientific field developed and some of the important people within it, I'm going to talk about the sort of larger issue of what I've already referenced a little bit, which is the field's um, entanglement with all the isms. So imperialism, racism, um, and, and Eurocentricism. Um, so these are just some dates that sort, sort of give you a summary of what happened to the Egyptian state um, after uh, it falls to uh, Rome in late antiquity. Um, and the main thing to know, uh, or the main date to notice from this slide um, is from 1517 to 1867, um, Egypt is part of the Ottoman Empire. So when European powers are first entering Egypt and this is Napoleon's campaign. Egypt is is under Muslim rule. It's 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 under Ottoman control, and there's already a presumption among white Westerners that Eastern empires are sort of lower on this very, um, you know, the, the, this social ladder, um, and so you see those those assumptions crop up in writings that we have about Egypt from the viewpoint of Westerners throughout this time. Uh, so as I said, from 1798 to 1801, we have Napoleon's military campaign. Um, and then from uh, 18, or, uh, and then a little bit after that, we have the coming of Muhammad al um, al Ali and his dynasty. So Muhammad al Ali was actually originally sent to Egypt by the Ottoman Empire as basically its its governor, um, and he uh, event he he basically carved out Egypt um, as his independent state to rule. Um, and then you have the formal British occupation from 1882 to 1922. Before 1882, Britain um, is gaining more and more power, but it's not until 1882 that they are formally um, in control of the full Egyptian state. Then in 1922, 22, Egypt um, is, the state of Egypt is granted um, independence, but you still have British and other foreign soldiers that have control of the Sioux as cut now. Um, and so that ends in 1953. And so that's why um, in this slide, it's, I, you know, it's, it's not until 53 that Egypt regains full independence. Uh, because until they ha they have control of Suez Canal, they don't have full control um, of their infrastructure. Um, and it's also very soon after 53 that an Egyptian is actually appointed head of the Antiquities Service, and that's Dr. Zahiha Was. Um, and uh, in the aftermath, 
from Lumbark's revolution, he um, was knocked off from that post. So there is now someone else who is uh, a native Egyptian that's now in charge of the antiquity service. Um, so as I've said, discipline of Egyptology in the West pre-1950-ish um, came out of Napoleon's Egyptian campaign. Um, it was definitely entangled with the larger geopolitics of the time, and that includes the imperialism and racism and Eurocentrism that were a part of that as well. Um, and so a lot of the early Western Egyptologists, um, some of them uh, made deliberate efforts to not have native Egyptians be part of the antiquities service um, and really keep European power um, and control of that side of things. Uh, so if you read a part or a full travel account, you know, of a European or of an American that's in Egypt anywhere from roughly 1800, you know, to 1950-ish, you'll get um, hints of some of these biases and some of the larger geopolitical changes um, in the country as well. So these are just some good nonfiction books that talk about this um, in, in more detail and really dive into particular aspects of it. Uh, so these two books here look um, at the growth of Egypt topology as a scientific discipline and its entanglements with that. Um, they also look at the development of the Cairo Museum and how the different departments within it were driven largely by Western interests and what Western wants um, and needs. This is the um, book that looks at the links between Francis Galton and Petrie in terms of the eugenics movement and some of that racism uh, that, you know, is, <laughs> makes Petrie not a perfect human. Uh, this book looks at the sort of larger question of, of antiquities overall, so not just Egyptian antiquities from those from different cultures that have ended up um, in different museums and the kind of the politics of, of that and that um, issue of repatriation. This um, book looks at Egyptomania, particularly um, in America, and how ideas of race kind of became entangled uh, with that as well. Uh, these are some good fiction or, or um, some historical fiction books that look at a lot of these same um, ideas. Um, so my favorite historical fiction series is probably the Amelia P. Body books. Um, so these are by Elizabeth Peters, um, and that is a pen, the Elizabeth Peters is a pen name of this author. Um, I think it's Barbara Mertz, who was an actual Egyptologist. Um, and so the, the basic characters, as I say here, are... Uh, Amelia P. Body, who first travels to Egypt um, in the second half of the 1800s um, as a tourist. She uh, meets her husband, uh, Radcliffe um, Emerson, who is basically presented uh, as a Petri 2.0. Um, and uh, they fall in love. And then the series follows their um, adventures and they solve mysteries um, during their dig. So throughout the series, you'll see Egyptology um, as, it as it develops um, as a field. And a lot of these larger geopolitical elements come um, in and out as well. And you'll see a lot of his um, historical Egyptologists pop in and out of the books um, as well. You can read the books in or order, but I have but I have not, and I've enjoyed them just as much. Unfortunately, I think that the author of this book um, is now deceased. Uh, I think that, I don't know exactly when she died, but I'm pretty sure it was 
recently. And then she apparently also wrote um, a non-fiction book about ancient Egypt that I think I also read and um, enjoyed as well. Uh, this is um, a book that she wrote that's connected with the Amelia P. Body series. Um, and so it's, uh, sorry, I just heard someone come in, which means there's going to be barking dogs, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> 